Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending upon where you are today. Uh, and welcome to the third event in our fall 2023 Global Economic Governance Book Talk series, uh, hosted by the Boston University Global Development Policy Center, uh, or the GDP Center, as we like to call ourselves. We're a university-wide research center that works to advance policy-oriented research on financial stability, human well-being, and environmental sustainability across the world. I'm Kevin Gallagher and I'm the inaugural director of the group. Well, yesterday, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development came out with their flagship, uh, uh, their flagship annual report, and they quantify that today, 3.3 billion people in the world are living in a country where they're spending more on external debt service than they are on health and education. Why don't these countries default? Well, that's the question. Uh, uh, Jerome Rose's new book, relatively new book called Why Not Default? Question mark. The Political Economy of Sovereign Debt. Uh, it really unravels the puzzle at the heart of these debates. Why despite frequent crises, ongoing crises that happen every three or four years uh, and the immense cost of repayment and the social cost for the spillovers that he talks about in his book, why do so many of these heavily indebted countries continue to service their international debts while they have to sacrifice health, education, livelihoods, and generations. In the new book, he provides an investigation of the political economy of sovereign debt and international crisis management from the rise of public borrowing in the Italian city-states uh, to the recent turmoil in the Eurozone and Argentina's uh, continuous uh, troubles. Drawing on in-depth case studies and, and really robust uh, theoretical framing and, and understanding, he looks at Mexico, Argentina, and Greece in this book, but this book isn't just about the past. It can really help us think about the moment we're in, and unfortunately, until we get a better regime that can deal with all these things, the moments that we'll be recurringly in uh, uh, moving into the future. Uh, Jerome is a fellow in international political economy at LSE, the London School of Economics, Why Not Default, received the Emanuel Wallerstein Memorial Book Award of the American Sociological Association. He's got a PhD uh, in political and social sciences from the European University Institute in Florence. Uh, let me give you a little logistics before we, uh, before we move on. Before I open the discussion, I wanna mention that this webinar is being live streamed on YouTube. So a recording is immediately accessible after this, uh, once we get started. And please use, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A box in your Zoom to ask questions. Please also give your name and affiliation so we can get to know each other and have a global conversation about this. Um, and after we uh, deliberate ourselves, after uh, Jerome gives a short presentation of the book, and I ask some questions, we'll open it up to all you folks and, and have a, a, a global conversation. So uh, really excited to have Jerome here. Welcome uh, to the GDP Center. Wish we could be here in person, but uh, how great it is that, uh, that you don't have to travel all the way here and, and we can do this and, and have a conversation with people from all over the world. Welcome to the GDP Center and share us uh, with some of the initial insights uh, from your book. Well, thanks so much, Kevin, for the introduction, for the invitation. Uh, it's really wonderful to be able to connect with all of you. Um, even though it's virtually, uh, like you say, it's fantastic that this is even possible. Um, I must say that I am traveling at the moment, so I am speaking from a hotel. Uh, I don't completely control my surroundings, so I hope it sort of stays silent in the area around me and that you can keep hearing me well. Um, but I just wanted to start out maybe with some remarks that allow us to get a better sense of you know, what is the context in which I decided to read or to write this book? Um, what is the sort of framing of the book and, and how did I come about um, sort of studying this particular question um, when, I, when I started out uh, with this research project? Uh, so the book is actually was conceived over a decade ago now, um, basically at the height of the Eurozone debt crisis in the 2010s. And it was really sort of at that time that I was quite active, becoming quite active um, at two levels. On the one hand, as an academic, uh, as a political economist, I was very interested in what was going on in the, in the Eurozone. Um, but at the same time, as a, as a participant in the anti-austerity movements in Southern Europe, living in Italy at the time, I was also very interested in what was going on in Greece, because that seemed to be sort of the front line uh, of the crisis, and also a place where a lot of these tensions around the debt question really came to a head. So I recall basically visiting Greece in the summer of 2011, and being absolutely mind 
uh, blown by the tremendous social mobilization that were happening at the time. Hundreds of thousands of people protesting in the streets uh, and demanding that the government rescind the austerity measures uh, that were being uh, imposed by the European Union and the International Monetary Fund in return for bailout loans that Greece needed to repay its debts to foreign banks. And when I saw those protests and the sort of roiling strikes that were happening and the violent riots, I was really sort of struck by something remarkable that made me think, like, what is it that makes the Greek government um, be more responsive to the financial obligations that it has to foreign creditors than to some of the democratic obligations that it has towards its own citizens? And it's not just the protests that made me think that, but poll after poll after poll showed that the Greek people in general were very much opposed to the austerity measures uh, that were being voted through parliament. And so there was a tension there. There was a tension between uh, Greece's responsibility towards its uh, financial creditors and its responsiveness to its own democratic constituency. And I decided to study this question more in depth and basically try to figure out why is it that countries repay their debt? And I soon found out that it's not just the Greek question that uh, that was interesting in that respect, but that this has been a question for a very long time. And economists have been um, trying to figure out for decades what it is that makes countries repay their debts. And in fact, they, they notice it's somewhat of a puzzle. Um, it's a puzzle because we can't really explain it if we depart from the presumptions of neoclassical economics. We can't really explain why this happens. Um, why do countries repay their debts? Um, the reason that we can't is that at the international level, we lack something really fundamental. We lack an international enforcement mechanism that will force heavily indebted countries to repay when they don't want to or when they cannot. And that differs a lot from what we have at the domestic level, right? At the domestic level, we have a government that can enforce contracts between creditors and debtors and make sure that when a debtor doesn't repay its debts, it is to some extent held to account. And so we have bankruptcy proceedings and all these sort of laws that, that deal with that type of problem. At the international level, we don't have that. Um, and the remarkable thing is that once you sort of depart from the, the assumptions of neoclassical economics, you would expect a sovereign borrower to actually respond to that situation, not by repaying its debts, but by doing the opposite. Um, after all, every time that it pays a debt, it kind of makes a welfare transfer from its own taxpayers to its foreign lenders. And whenever it does that, money flows out of the country and it's never seen again. And so the question is, why do countries keep sending these transfers abroad? Why don't they, at some point, if there's a major crisis like the one that happened in Greece, why don't they simply suspend their payments and um, impose a temporary moratorium on their payments until they are in a position where they're able to resume those payments? And so that's sort of a puzzle at the heart of the economics literature. Um, but it's also a puzzle once we place international debt crises in their more historical perspective. Uh, because the moment that we do that, what we actually see is that prior to World War II, it was very common for debtors, heavily indebted countries in times of crisis to simply suspend their payments. So if you go back to the 19th century or the early 20th century, and you look at major debt crises, for instance, in the 1820s, or during the long depression of the 1870s to the 1890s, or the Great Depression of the 1930s, we see again and again a very similar response. Uh, we see that debtor countries generally respond by stopping to pay their debts instead of continuing to pay them. Um, and that contrasts very sharply to what we've seen in the last 40, 50 years or so, ever since the 70s and 80s. So once I began to realize that, that there was not just an interesting political question here in terms of what was happening in Europe at that time, but also an interesting academic puzzle, um, that's when I decided, okay, this, there's an interesting story here to be told in terms of a, how, how this shift came about in the global political economy, how we went from a situation where um, debt crises were resolved simply through these unilateral suspensions of payment to a situation in which that has become a very rare occurrence. So rare, in fact, that during, if I recall the numbers correctly, during the height of the Eurozone debt crisis, only 0.2% of global outstanding debt was in a state of default. And we would possibly expect that number to be much, much higher given the severity and the intensity of the crisis that was roiling uh, the large part of the Eurozone um, and, and other parts of the world. 
So that's kind of the puzzle that set me uh, on, a, on a journey that eventually became this book. And um, one thing that I realized fairly quickly was that there was something remarkable about the approach in the economics literature, um, which almost entirely stripped out the question of politics um, and of ultimately of power uh, from their frameworks. And I thought that perhaps there was something here that allowed me to make a novel uh, contribution by looking at these fundamental sort of conflicts that occur during times of crisis between, on the one hand, the debtor country and its international creditors, but on the other hand, also within the debtor country, uh, between different social groups, uh, over who is to bear the, the cost of adjustments, the burden of adjustments. And so that kind of became the, the origin point for what I would call a critical political economy approach to try to bring the question of power to the heart of the study of sovereign debt and international crisis management, and really figure out what is it that makes creditors powerful and what are the mechanisms that allow creditors to um, force debtors to repay in times of crisis, even if they don't want to, or even if they can't. And so that's kind of the starting point for the research project. And as you noted, I decided to take a kind of comparative historical approach in answering that question. So on the one hand, um, I have this comparison um, in terms of the world system, the global political economy, looking at the pre-war and the post-war periods and, and sort of figuring out this contrast in, in terms of crisis management. And then at the same time, I have these case studies where I look at, at the contemporary period through the lens of a couple of major international debt crises that have roiled the world over the past four decades or so. So those are Mexico, Argentina, and Greece. And if there's interest, we can talk about those a little bit more uh, in detail later on. Uh, but that kind of became the framework for the, um, for the study. And uh, that set me off on the journey that eventually uh, would become this book. Terrific. Well, with my background, I can't give a great, here it is. Here's what, whoops, no, I can't do a great job. Here's the title, but, uh, but it's a, it's a terrific, uh, it's a terrific and, and, and very full book, but uh, thanks for sharing the background and, and where it came from. And, and uh, this, uh, this really went from, uh, from, from the streets to the blackboard uh, to black ink and, and uh, it's a rich book and congratulations on the, on the award that you got for it. Um, to explain, you know, you're right, uh, as, a, as a recovering economist, someone who's been trained as an economist, we all learned the Eaton and Gersovich article, which, mm -hmm. uh, which shows that the reason why countries uh, aren't going to do this is because uh, they, they can get shut out of capital markets and that, and that the capital markets can act as a monopoly. But uh, you, you say it's, it's much bigger than that. Uh, and you, you evoke um, and pay homage throughout the book uh, to the great political economist, uh, Susan Strange, and you call this a structural power, that it's, it's more than just a, a monopoly power by, by folks at the at sort of upstream who are the capital markets, but that it's enforced on some level through governments in the global north, whether that be the Paris Club, the International Monetary Fund, and many of the different legal arrangements that are, that are embedded in the contracts of the, uh, of the bonds and some of the debt uh, themselves, and then another piece that you really add to the story that uh, that others don't is that no borrowing country uh, should be treated monolithically, and that there are also domestic elites that are connected to that structure of power that um, that really play a role on the home front to uh, play a role to be a cheerleader and to co-enforce uh, the structural power that is going through it. So it's a a wonderful book that that adds a whole new theoretical framework that really traces a bond or a loan from where it comes from to where it goes and when it disappears, who gets hurt, what the distributional impacts uh, to real people are uh, during times of stress. And, and I wanna stress that we're, we're in one of those, uh, we're in one of those right now. One article that you, you didn't cite in the book um, is an article by Bullo and Rogoff in the American Economic Review in the late late 1980s. I, I can't I can't remember about it. And they say they they are also trying to solve this puzzle that you're that you you so eloquently put out with Eaton and Gersovich. And they say, well, there there might be two ways out of this. Uh, one is if you've got a big huge domestic economy and you're not so you know you're you're not so you don't have that much exposure to international capital if you got shut off forever. Uh, you could, you know, if you're a, a big Brazil or an in India, you could, 
you, you could just be sort of isolationist until you until you grew and then everyone would want to come back in anyway. That's one uh, one one situation. But um, the countries, even though you know relatively large countries that you're dealing with in your book, uh, wouldn't necessarily fall in that category. But the other condition that they say is that if there's a large external creditor that doesn't collude with those monopolists, uh, meaning the private capital markets that are so prevalent today, and in today's world, we're sort of there, right? That private creditor who is not standing side by side with uh, the PIMCOs and standard charters of the world is the China Development Bank, the Export Import Bank uh, of China and so forth. And so obviously that wasn't as big of a uh, a, a big, as big of a specter when you were writing this book. But to what extent uh, would Bullo and Rogoff uh, be onto something here? And as we look at today's world, do, is is China uh, a, th a third wheel out here that makes it harder to, for the for the for those who hold structural power uh, to be able to impose it uh, throughout the whole power value chain that you so eloquently sort of trace in the book? Right, I think that's a, a fascinating question in terms of where we are today, because that's that really gets to the, the core, I think, of the shift that we are seeing at the moment and some of the changes that are occurring, have occurred uh, since I started researching the book and since it was published. Um, and so I do think that this is a very important question. And I, I, I think I refer to it, not specifically the article that you mentioned, but to the broader question. When I try to trace these mechanisms through which the structural power of, of creditors is brought to bear, and the one thing I note is that that structural power is brought to bear um, in large part because creditors are in a position to withhold the credit upon which the debtor countries, the borrowing countries, depend um, for the functioning of government, but also for the general functioning of their economy. So in a highly sort of financialized context in which we live today, both governments and, and, and economies cannot function without the flow of credit um, continuously sort of flowing through the economy and, and con continuous sort of disbursement of short-term and long-term credit lines to the government. Um, but that really capacity to withhold that credit only really works if um, there is sort of one set of creditors that can act in unison, that can act together and that can say collectively, okay, if you don't repay your debt, we're gonna stop lending you further money and that punishment should be severe enough because the economic costs of that will be sort of unbearable in the short term. Right? So that's kind of the argument I developed. But that mechanism could potentially break down the moment that a borrowing country has alternative sources of credit. And if it could turn, for instance, to a major lender like China uh, to obtain financing that it can no longer obtain from Western private creditors or um, bilateral lenders in the West or international development banks, um, then it could potentially circumvent that power structure. And so I think that it's very important that you know, we're, we should be aware of this dynamic of, of China's rise as a major lender uh, because it, I think it fundamentally alters some of the power uh, mechanisms uh, that we've seen at work in the global political economy over the last four decades. So I think this is a fundamental development and in a sense, it would require perhaps another book to be able to incorporate that and the consequences of that um, uh, for, for my own framework. Um, but you're right, like at the time that I was writing this book, the main lenders, um, to Greece, for instance, were predominantly banks in the so-called core countries of the Eurozone, uh, French, German banks, uh, also some banks outside of the Eurozone, uh, English banks, uh, but predominantly banks in the, the wealthy European countries and some in North America. And that was the same story for much of uh, the 1980s, for instance, when there were large uh, lending uh, um, uh, groups of, of, of Western banks and some Japanese banks uh, that were providing these loans. And later in the 90s, we saw other institutions get involved, pension funds, mutual funds, those type of institutions. Um, but I do think, to get back to your question, that the, the rise of China alters this dynamic to a certain extent because it, it, it gives an, an, an exit option. It gives another alternative for financing outside of this creditor cartel, as I call it, in the, in the Western world. Yeah, fascinating. There's, there's, some, there's some evidence of that. I, I know... Um... When, when Ecuador about a decade ago was having a, a, harsh, a harsh crisis, they were completely shut out of, of capital markets and they went to China, uh, got, got some loans, they invested it, it, it caused growth. And then Moody's actually upgraded their credit rating, citing the Chinese loans and the investments that came to it. And then 
the capital markets uh, came back for for and 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 here again they're they're in a precarious situation. We'll we'll see where China plays a role in that now. So obviously you have a positivist approach where you're trying to analyze this situation and you theorize that there is this structural power. But like you said in your opening remarks, this came out of not just treating the system as a specimen, but trying to also do policy-oriented theorizing and, and research to, uh, to, try to, to try to solve this sort of glaring gap in the global economic governance system. And you hinted, um, you hinted what, uh, at, at, at what, what, would re what really needs to be done. You say that, uh, that these policies need to be contested from below. And you said that uh, that you yourself were involved in protests and so forth. Um, there were also, if you read the book and, and go on YouTube, you can and see the the, the incredible protests that, that happened in in Argentina at the turn of the century. Um, Mexico, not as much, but they were they were definitely there for there there for sure. Um, but when you get to the end of those chapters in your book, the un, you know with all that great social movement, they didn't move the needle uh, enough to disrupt structural power. So if you were uh, advising the folks on the streets in Kenya or Egypt right now, uh, or back in, in, in Argentina again, in, the, in Lao PDR, in Pakistan, uh, where, where all of this is, is, uh, is in Sri Lanka, where all of this is, is being played in, in front of us, what kinds of actors, coalitions, education, organizing, what, what, what would be needed that wasn't able to get Greece, Argentina, or Mexico to cross that line? Right, that's a great question. I don't know if you can still hear me because you blocked out on my end a little bit. You can still hear me, great. Um, so that's a fantastic question. I think the question of contestation has been central um, to many debt crises precisely because these are times of conflict, right? So they're explosive times when there are scarce resources and they need to be allocated somehow. So either they're allocated to debt repayment or they're allocated to public services, uh, but you cannot allocate the same dollar to two different uh, things at the same time. Um, so what you get is you get a kind of, um, I'm not a, generally a kind of zero game, a zero sum thinker, but in this context of scarcity of resources, that's the reality. And so you get these intense struggles over the allocation of resources. People protest um, when they find that their own livelihoods are under attack. Uh, but what I find in my case studies, as you know, is that they're not always successful in actually pushing through their preferred outcome, which might be, you know, the reversal of these austerity measures or even, you know, an active default by their government. Um, and so I kind of circle back to that in the conclusion of the book, where I know that we need more than just these protests, um, because we cannot depend on unilateral action by the borrowing countries themselves to achieve more equitable outcomes at the global level, because this is a structural problem. It's a problem that exists within the financial architecture, within the existing debt regime. And um, we see it sort of at such a large global level. We see these repeated outcomes that are so disadvantageous to the debtor countries and to the ordinary people inside these debtor countries um, that there must be something larger at work here. Um, and so what I would say to those people is essentially what is necessary is some kind of international coordination that goes beyond borders and that allows for what we could call a united front um, in the debtor countries, in the creditor countries, that pushes for fundamental reform at the global level. Um, because this is not something that can be solved on a case-by-case -case basis in individual countries whenever they go into crisis. And that's precisely what we've seen, in fact, since the 1980s, is that that's been the preferred approach of the creditor countries. And for a good reason, it is because if you treat these crises on a case-by-case -case basis, you constantly put the united front of creditors against an individual debtor and you have a power dynamic that totally over, um, overpowers the, the debtor country. So you need some kind of international coordination. You need some kind of international cooperation um, to uh, basically achieve a better uh, debt restructuring mechanism or any debt restructuring mechanism at the international level. Uh, but I also note in the conclusion that there is a number of attempts that have been made over time to try to get to such a situation and we find that creditors tend to be quite um, resistant to that type of change, to put it mildly. And uh, the reason for that is that it's simply not always perceived to be in their short-term interest. Uh, 
And so what's definitely necessary is that there is some kind of um, double pressure, if you will. Uh, civil society organizations in the global north have to work together with groups in the global south uh, to achieve sort of common aims uh, to create that sort of new debt regime that allows for an international restructuring mechanism to come into place. But here, precisely, I think the, the rise of China plays a, a kind of double contradictory role, right? So we could say that the rise of China as a lender has greatly complicated matters uh, at the level of resolving these individual debt crises on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but it's precisely that complication that is now pushing uh, uh, an awareness that there needs to be more structural reform at the global level. And I think that, um, you know, if we look back at where we were 10 years ago and we look at where we are today, I feel that at least the conversation is moving on. And um, I'm hoping, hopeful, that there will be further uh, evolution as we, as we go on uh, in that respect. Uh, but ultimately, yes, I mean, there's not going to be any solution at the individual nation state level to this problem. So there needs to be some level of international coordination there. Yeah, thanks so much, folks. I'm going to just ask him one more question. And uh, like I said in the beginning of the webinar, you can go and I see that we have a couple already. Go to the Q&A box, uh, pop that open, share with us your, your name uh, and affiliation and uh, ask a question. And I can I can feel those to Jerome um, after after this last one. So uh, obviously, all, all of you folks out there that are watching what's going on and in Ethiopia, Chad, Egypt, Lao PDR, the list goes on. The GDP Center actually is part of a group called Debt Relief for a Green and Inclusive Recovery, where we've done a number of studies. Uh, and we estimate that upward, somewhere between 60 and 70 countries should default and, and re renegotiate their debts right now. And so uh, folks tend to forget about these things uh, when, they, when they seem to go away. Um, and then when they're right in front of us, like they are now with these 3.3 billion people facing more external debt service than they are paying for health and education, uh, everyone wants to get, uh, everyone wants to, you know, get, try to help solve the problem here. And, um, but history matters and there's a, there's a lot of work that's been done. So if, uh, if I'm recommending that uh, anyone who's trying to think about whether you're, a new generation of a student or you're out there on the streets or you're a fi finance minister in, in, in one of these countries or in the United States Treasury, I recommend Why Not Default, The Political Economy of Sovereign Debt by Jerome Roos. Uh, Jerome, what's your favorite five? You know, what, what, what should you be telling? What would you tell all these people? What are, what are some, what, what would you say the five, five key books or, or articles that you read that really inspired you and helped you frame this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this theory of, of structural power and, and sovereign debt that folks, uh, folks should go out there and, and get after they get your book? Right, that's a great question. Um, you kind of surprised me with that question too. So I would have to now quickly make a selection in my head of the many sort of fantastic books that I've read on this question. But maybe I could just start by some books that have inspired me on my journey, um, both while writing this book and also since, because my thinking has also evolved a little bit since I published the book. Um, I would say that one book, it's not necessarily on the sovereign debt question, uh, but I think that it was very important for me in framing um, the problem of financialization and the transformations in the world system, in the global political economy over the last 40 years or so. And that was a book by an Italian historical sociologist and political economist uh, named Giovanni Arrighi. Um, his book is called The Long 20th Century, Money, Power, and the Origins of Our Time. And... Um, Perhaps my debt to Arrighi is not immediately apparent in this book. I think it's more apparent in some of the work that I'm doing now. Uh, but it's, it's a very interesting book that shows how, you know, the, the rise of finance is actually a cyclically repeating thing that recurs throughout history. And it usually indicates a particular uh, situation in the global political economy at which certain conflicts come to a head and a major transition is coming. And so I would definitely advise people who are interested in the question of international finance and financialization to read that book. Um, when it comes to the question of structural power, you already mentioned my debt to Susan Strange. Um, she's written a number of books, um, most of them in the 80s and 90s. Uh, unfortunately, she passed away quite some time ago, so uh, she hasn't uh, been able to reflect on what happened in the post-financial crisis period. Uh, but her work was very formative in the sort of foundation of the global political economy or international political economy discipline, and especially the study of the structural power of finance. So her work is very relevant. She's got many books. You can look them up. Um, 
I think that would be very interesting. Uh, then someone whose book I think was very relevant for me as I um, started working on the Eurozone debt crisis uh, was a German sociologist called uh, Wolfgang Streck, who wrote a book called Buying Time. Um, Buying Time is basically an analysis of the last 40 years or so of neoliberalization. And it looks at the role that public debt has played as a way for um, the international economy and for the, the, the Western countries to buy time in the face of a deepening crisis. And the crisis, he argues, started in the 70s and it continues today. Um, it's a continuous sort of sequence or series of crises that has never really stopped. Um, but it's been, uh, in one way or another, it's been with us. And debt, according to him, is one way that the system manages to adapt itself and buy time and move forward until one day, you know, that comes to a head and the debts need to be repaid. And that's the situation that we're in today when it concerns a lot of developing countries. So I think that's also a very relevant book, particularly for the Eurozone context, but perhaps also more, more broadly than that. I think that's three books. Um, others, uh, there are important ones. I could mention, for instance, a book that perhaps I don't agree with in every single respect, but that is very important. That's uh, the book by Reinhard and Rogoff. Uh, this time is different. Uh, it's a book from which I took a lot of data. It's a book that's very rich in its sort of economic uh, history, assessment of international debt crises, and kind of a, um, a classic, if you will, for the more mainstream approach to uh, the international debt question. Um, and then there are many other books that I could think of, but anything from the top of my head, um, I mean, read anything by Kevin Gallagher right now on uh, debt relief in the current situation, because I think that, you know, if we want to draw this to the to the current moment that we're in, I think what's happening right now is you're doing some very important work on that. Uh, there's clearly a need for some kind of reform at the global level and uh, any sort of thinking that's being done on that at, at Boston University is, I think, very central to that effort. Um, so someone asked to see a question of the name of the German sociologist. His name is Wolfgang Streeck, or Streeck, and the title of the book is Buying Time. Um, so that makes for five, but I think I could come up with many others. Here you go. Well, and as you said, Susan Strange has a has a has a whole uh, has a laundry list of them. So you, you hit you hit ten. Well, uh, well, right. great, uh, folks. Uh, I, I I love all those. Thanks for the plug for us. I I can't take personal. Uh, credit for all of that. The GDP Center is doing some of this work with uh, the Center for Sustainable Finance at SOAS London and the Heinrich Boll Foundation, in, a, in addition to a number of collaborators. But thanks. Maybe we can put that on the chat as well. So we have a, a number of questions here. Let me start off with a couple of them. And for those of you who are out there uh, on Zoom, go to your Q&A box, add your name and add a question, and we'll uh, we'll try to get to it. We um, we have two that are that are somewhat that are somewhat similar. Getting getting to the to the same issue uh, by Luke Gibson, who is a policy and advocacy advisor at Eurodad, the European Network for Debt and Development, and uh, Federico Federico uh, Sabaya Sabaja, um, who is an IMF campaigner for an organization named Recourse, and uh, and wants us also to know that he's he's from uh, Argentina, the home of the uh, victors of the current World Cup. Uh, both of these folks are, are asking um, uh, about reflections about the extent to which debtors clubs, right? So you're talking in your book a little bit more about why don't I, Lao PDR, just unilaterally default? Both of these folks are sort of saying, could, could borrower countries collectively threaten to default on their debts? Would this increase their, stru their structural power in debt restructuring negotiations? What do you think that, would the barriers be to that? Uh, how and how might those be be overcome? And Federico's is uh, is similar, but he notes um, that this isn't just a, an idea; that this has been tried bu tried before in the 1980s. There was a, a Cartagena Club, which I, I do think you note to us uh, for a bit in in the book. So, uh, why don't you reflect on on Luke and, and Federico? These are great questions, and I think. Um... They, they cut to the heart of this power dynamic, right? So we have on the one hand, we have a creditor um, club that's quite united or tends to be quite united, at least prior to the rise of China as a major lender. And on the other hand, we've got debtors who are mainly dispersed. And the question is, if you bring those dispersed debtors together, could they pose a counter power, if you will, to those united creditors? And as you know, I mean, there's been that 
uh, attempt in the in the context of the Latin American debt crisis of the 1980s with the Cartagena Club. Um, and there's also been an effort at that time uh, after Argentina, the transition to democracy, uh, to create what they called a debtors cartel, to confront the creditors cartel. And there's other initiatives. I think also in the 1980s, uh, there was a call from um, the president of Burkina Faso, Thomas Sangara, um, the revolutionary leader, um, who uh, called for a united front against the debt. Uh, and so this is kind of a recurring question that's propped up over, over the years. And I think it's a very interesting one to study, to see what went right and what went wrong in, in attempts to build that type of dynamic. I think in theory, it could be very important um, for debtors to bond together. And I think that's actually you know, down to the simple um, expression that if you owe the bank $100, uh, it's your problem, right? But if you owe the bank a million or a billion dollars, it's the bank's problem. So if the creditors bond together and threaten to collectively default, it would be a much greater hit for the creditors. And therefore, they would be more incentivized to listen to what the debtors are demanding. And it might sort of reverse this power dynamic. And I think theoretically, that's absolutely true. And it's something that we can you know, we can pursue and we can look at to what extent that could be successful. But in practice, it has turned out to be very difficult to do that. Um, and there was actually a good paper in the 1980s that tried to explain why that was. So why did the Cartagena Club um, not succeed in bringing the debtors together? Why did the debtors cartel fail when the credit cartel succeeded? And the one explanation that was offered for that is basically explained by a concept called credit rating self-preservation by an article by Klein. We argued that, in fact, what happened when Argentina called for a debtor cartel, um, Mexico got scared because Mexico thought if Argentina is calling for a debtor's cartel, then the creditors are going to get scared, that all of us are going to bond together and they're going to charge higher borrowing costs from all of us. So what Mexico tried to do the moment that Argentina made that proposal is they tried to distance themselves from Argentina and they said, no, 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 we are not Argentina. We want to have close relations with our creditors. We want to work collaboratively and we want to keep our credit rating as, as good as it could be. Um, and so what you get is a kind of fissions, uh, fissures within uh, the debtors uh, collective uh, that lead to a situation where individual debtors tend to go their own way because they're afraid that being associated with other more rec recalcitrant debtors will hurt their credit rating. And so that has turned out to be very difficult. And, you know, perhaps, you know, that shouldn't stop us from trying uh, to bring the debtors together. Uh, but it is a factor that history has pro proven to, um, uh, to, to, to make it very difficult um, to do in practice. Um, maybe back to you for the next question. Yeah, terrific. Uh, building on that, we have a question from Shanti uh, from the Bank of Indonesia. And he says, very, in very insightful book and, and presentation. Uh, what do you think about the G20 or the Brooks, excuse me, or the BRICS uh, as an avenue to address the question you raised regarding efforts needed at the global level to challenge the structural power held by the international financial institutions. Uh, do you think the BRICS uh, in particular, which Argentina has, uh, has just become a member of, do you think that is a force of potential counter power to, to, to turn structural power upside down? Yeah, as I, as I mentioned in my response to Kevin's first question, I think the, the rise of China, and we can take that more broadly and look at the rise of a number of global South powers, Brazil, India, South Africa, uh, the, the BRICS, um, that is a fundamental factor in altering the power dynamics in the global political economy today. And I think that we would need to revise some of the things I wrote in this book in light of these things happening today, um, because they are altering the structural power dynamics. Um, I do think that the, the group of BRICS is internally also quite divided in terms of who wants what and who has what interests. And so I would, I would be hesitant to say that Brazil is entirely aligned with China or that India is entirely aligned with China on this. Um, so I don't, I don't know to what extent we could say that BRICS will definitely pose a unified challenge to this uh, existing system. But what I think it does is that it forces the world, and in particular the Western world, to recognize that the case-by-case -case approach that has been pursuing for the past 40 years is simply not working. It was, I mean, for the global economy and for the debtor countries, it's never been working. Um, but it's been working for the creditors for 40 years uh, because it allowed them to wield the structural power in one-on-one -on -one negotiations with individual debtors. That 
is only possible if the creditors can present a unified front and if they can sort of work together to some extent. Now that you've got the BRICS, now that you've got China at the table, it seems like that type of collaboration is becoming harder and harder. And so, you know, suddenly people in the West are speaking about the dysfunction of the international debt regime which in a sense has been dysfunctional for the past 40 years. Um, but the fact that there's this awareness now that it's dysfunctional might perhaps force changes that previously would have been inconceivable. And that's what I'm hoping this will do, not necessarily because of the proposals made out of BRICS, although those could perhaps play a role, um, but simply because the situation is really becoming unsustainable. Um, so what you have is a one by one case, uh, case by case approach, but you've got a bunch of new creditors, including China, which often can't agree with the multilateral lenders, which can't agree with the bilateral Paris Club uh, creditors, which can't agree with the private creditors in the West. Uh, and so it's harder and harder, as the case of Zambia demonstrates, to arrive at a situation where meaningful debt relief can be provided. Um, and perhaps that difficulty is precisely what will make it necessary to get some kind of global um, arrangement in place. And so I'm hoping that that will be the positive role of the rise of the BRICS powers. Um, but what actually comes out of that remains to be seen. Of course, China's a creditor, but the but most of the other BRICs aren't really net creditors. And our next question is more, uh, you know, trying to understand uh, your insights on, on creditor behavior. So we have a question here from Pragya Raj Singh, who's actually a Boston University master's student. And she asked, well, could you see using debt overhang theory? And the debt overhang just means for those of you out there that uh, if your debts are so high, you can't take take on any more debt and therefore you can't invest and the economy is gonna slow down and and uh, and and hit a wall and 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 sort of have a, a you know sort of a fundamental structural underdevelopment and underinvestment program. Isn't that uh, Pragya asks? Isn't that a rationale for creditors to allow some debt relief because then there wouldn't be anything else to invest in in that particular country? As I, I'm sort of extrapolating what she's what she's saying, but I think that's what that's what she's getting at. What, what are your thoughts there? Right. I think that you could make a distinction between what would be the short-term interests of creditors and what would be, you know, we could call it the enlightened long-term interest of creditors, and perhaps. In the short term, um, the main concern that a creditor has is to get as much of its payment back immediately, now, um, as soon as it can. Um, but obviously, the consequence of that is precisely what you what you what you know is that you get this debt overhang that then makes it impossible for the country to grow, and therefore, you know, makes it impossible for the creditor to profit from lending to that country in the future because there is no growth potential, no capacity to repay, and therefore, in the long run, the creditor is shooting itself in the foot because it's eliminating a potential source of profit in the future. Um, so that's why a lot of people who do argue for this kind of international debt restructuring mechanism at the global level would say that it's not just in the interest of the debtors, it's actually in the interest of everyone. Uh, it may not be in the interest of individual creditors in the short term, but it is in the interest of the collective of creditors in the long term that there is a level of predictability, a level of order uh, in the financial markets, and um, that ultimately most debts that can be repaid are repaid and you know for that very reason that's why we have bankruptcy regimes at the national level um, that's why we have bankruptcy regimes that ensure that a company or an individual that has too many debts that it cannot repay um, will go through a certain process that protects certain um, assets that protects certain uh, minimum level of income on the part of the debtor in order to ensure that that debtor doesn't completely get squashed you know we don't have debtors prisons anymore at the national level. Uh, and for the same reason, we shouldn't have debtors prisons at the international level. It's not just in the interest of the debtors, but it's in the interest of the creditors in the long haul that this system is made more stable and more predictable. And for that, you do need something to deal with that problem of debt overhang. Um, so I, I exactly, I, I would agree with the way that that question is framed. Uh, it is ultimately in everyone's interest. The hard part is convincing the creditors to do it now. And that's why you need some kind of counterpower um, whether that's a state or a group of states or some kind of international um, mechanism uh, that, that sort of rationalizes this entire procedure of debt restructuring. Like you said, uh, and I say in my classes all the time, if you owe me a hundred bucks, it's your problem. If you owe me a, a billion or a hundred billion, it's my problem. And I think that might explain a little bit about what's going on here, especially with the debt crisis in the, in the global south this time. Right. Greece was 
was somewhat different because it's a relatively large economy and important for the Eurozone. And the time that we had the most significant debt relief in the 1990s uh, was when the, most of the global banks in the North had the massive exposure in the global South. And uh, therefore, they, um, they, there was really a lot at stake. But now, especially the countries that are that are in distress, um, it is a little bit more like a, a hundred bucks for some of these huge private capital uh, companies, uh, where the majority of their capital are in are in banks and, and non banks uh, in 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 the global north, and and what's in the global south is a mar is sort of at the margin, which from one level. Uh, if they did provide debt relief for everyone now, it wouldn't be that costly. It was actually significantly costly for all these folks in the 1990s. Um, but there's precedent and this structural power here that, that, that you're talking about in, in today's world. Let me move to Jean Meyer, uh, Currency Stability Standard Project. The UN discussions have been about debt payments overwhelming social services needs as well. Uh, one among other concerns re is related to tax collection by domestic governments. Um, certainly the global South is plagued with excessive interest rates on debt. Um, how do you see, uh, how do you see this? Uh, excuse me. So let me see, uh, I see the question right. here. I'm not- John, John Meyer, um, forgive me for- we're not uh, not describing it as well. I think he's um, he's he's uh, also talking about the tax dimension. Uh, let me uh, let me bring in a different one. If then, um, uh, actually, great to great to see Barry Herman here. Uh, Barry Herman is a is a veteran on on these issues, and uh, he's um, uh, he edited a great book uh, on these issues with uh, Joe Stiglitz and Jose Antonio Campo. Uh, during during about a decade ago, too. Uh, his question or comment is, uh, one important aspect of the story since the 1980s has been the U.S. Treasury, in essence, as the coordinator of private creditors and influence at the International Monetary Fund. In the fracturing of U.S. hegemony, is this another side of the China effect? Important, go uh, important going forward as well. Is that true? Well, I think that I mean, absolutely. The way I describe it in the book, I mean, the U.S. Treasury has been a fundamental sort of pillar of the structural power of finance because it's always stood behind the bond market, if you will, or behind the banking system when push came to shove. Um, and when, you know, when the Mexican debt crisis broke out in 1982, for instance, the Treasury Department played a major role in influencing um, the Reagan administration in trying to bail out Mexico, as it were, to impress upon the Reagan administration that, hey, there's something going on here. And if we don't step in, if we don't do something, it's our own banks that are on the hook. Um, so we saw that again in the Argentina case, and we saw it again sort of behind the scenes in the, in the Eurozone debt crisis. So the US Treasury has been a very important player in that respect. Um, I'm not 100% sure if I, if I understand the second part of the, the, the question, but I think if the question is, you know, how is this affected by the rise of China? I do think that then what we get is that, you know, what, what I mentioned before is that you have this alternative lender coming into play. It perhaps makes the world less dependent on the, on the, the vagaries, if you will, of the decisions made at the level of the U.S. Treasury and uh, allows for, you know, for individual borrowers to look elsewhere for, for, for credit if they need it. And that perhaps reduces the structural power of the U.S. government, um, reduces the role of the U.S. Treasury Department, and in, and in that sense may open up opportunities for developing countries to play a part, their, their, their creditors, and obtain a better deal. Um, and I think that's a foundational sort of de fundamental development that will really alter the power dynamics in the global, global economy moving forward. And so that's definitely something to be, to be looking at uh, over the next years and decades. Thanks so much. Well, I think we're, uh, we've run out of time. Uh, please look in the chat. Uh, you can get a link to the book to order the book itself. And uh, he also spelt uh, Wolfgang Street's name right so that you can, uh, you can order one of his favorite five as well. Before we leave um, and thank, uh, thank Jerome, I just want to give folks a head up, heads up about the next uh, webinar in this series. This one will actually be hybrid uh, here live at Boston University, but also online. Uh, and we'll have the opportunity to uh, 
to welcome Eric Haliner from the University of Waterloo, uh, who is cited in, in Jerome's book. His new book is called The Contested World Economy, The Deep and Global Roots of International Political Economy. That'll be on uh, November 9th, uh, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So depending upon where you are today, that one might be, uh, might be tough for you to catch. But like I said earlier, uh, these are also live streamed and, and then on the GDP Center YouTube page. So you can watch these when you wake up the next day if you can't, uh, if you can't catch, us, uh, catch us live. Well, uh, on behalf of the GDP Center and, and, and the, the numerous folks that we had in the crowd, Jerome Roos, thanks so much for, uh, for sharing the insights on your book and giving us some vision about the present situation we're in in the future. And uh, sounds like you got a new project on, so give us a call when, when, that, one, uh, when that one's hot off the presses too. Thank you and, and thanks to everyone else. If you wanna learn more about the GDP Center in general, our, our, uh, our webpage is uh, on, on the chat and, and you can follow the center on X uh, as well as many of the researchers here and, uh, and Jerome as well. Thanks so much, Jerome. Thank you. It's been wonderful to connect and thank you very much everyone for joining and Kevin and Maureen and